My PhD project was first motivated by a broad question. What's queer about book history? During my MSc in book history, I wrestled with the lack of queer representation, the consistent repetition of straight male sources for the ways we understand print culture, particularly when studying pre 20th century print culture. This problem roots in the origins of bibliography and book history. The field initially emerged as an independent academic discipline in the 19th century among circles of rich male antiquarian book collectors. The qualities they valued in a book as a collectible object, expensive material design, authenticity and traceable male authorship have been reproduced by later scholars of print culture, dictating which printed material gets studied and preserved in archives. Caden Henningsen recently dubbed this ongoing paradigm biblionormativity. This set of values is baked into influential models of book history that are still in use today, such as Danton's communication circuit. This is important because it affects the way we understand bookish agency. As we see in shows like Black Books, the figure of the grumpy and isolated straight man as a truly bookish figure is still reproduced in the 21st century. These biblionormative values are a barrier to preserving, unearthing and studying queer print cultures. Because of the need to stay clandestine and covertly circulate information, Queer reading material has often been cheaply produced, ephemeral and anonymous. We might call this set of values biblioqueer. Queer bibliographers and archivists work to preserve and study important queer printing from the 20th century, such as zines, activist flyers and ephemera, homemade travel guides, pride banners and pornography, of course. But what about before the 20th century? In the 18th and 19th centuries, queer people were persecuted under sodomy laws and did not yet have the language of identity that modern LGBTQ plus people use to self-advocate. Openly queer printed material was rare and most queer objects that did make it into the world were suppressed or destroyed. So what can the queer book historian do about this? One possible solution is to hunt down the traces of queer people that do survive and highlight them, such as Brooke Palmieri's re brilliant recent work on trans bookseller John de Verdian and camp macaroni printer Samuel Drybatter. But the problem with this approach is that it risks becoming tokenistic. How do we break the biblionormative paradigm itself? As feminist thinkers have argued, we need a major reconceptualization of labor history in order to recover women's significance in the flow of history. And this also applies to queer historical labor. In order to reconceptualize bookish history and recover the work done by queer people, especially queer women and gender non-conforming people, I would like to advocate for the importance of studying the history of reading. Reading is a life-saving resource for many queer people today often providing the only covert resource for understanding feelings, building a sense of identity and finding community. My PhD aims to show how this important role of reading was also true for queer readers in the 19th century. Reading has often been understood as a passive activity. In the 19th century, there was a lot of anxiety about women's reading and fem feminine novel reading in particular was often seen as idle consumption and even as morally degenerate. Much later scholarship on reading has reiterated this assumption. However, as I study various queer women and GNC readers, their reading emerges as an active interventional form of labor. Perhaps we can instead borrow Mikel de Certo's idea of reading as poaching, as a participatory remaking of text, an appropriation of printed material to meet queer needs and sustain queer lives and identities. For example, Geraldine Dewsbury supported herself for four decades by working as a publisher's reader and as a book reviewer. This meant that her reading significantly but invisibly influenced what did and didn't get published and read in the mid-Victorian market. This work also enabled her to live independently so that she could pursue a devoted courtship to Jane Welsh Carlyle. Anne Lister, another avid and lifelong reader from earlier in the century, spent chunks of her infamous diaries documenting, commenting on and indexing her reading. As well as enjoying Rousseau and the Romantics, perhaps a little too much, 
She also read widely in agricultural science, and in her diary, she discusses the importance of learning land management in order to establish herself as a knowledgeable and progressive landowner. So through her reading, she was participating in a specific early 19th century version of masculine gentility in order to lend credibility to her masculine gender presentations and to fend off challenges to her inheritance of Shibden Hall and its surrounding farmland. So ultimately, this question, what's queer about book history, has led me to my research project, The Queer Woman Reader in the 19th Century. Thanks for watching.